cloud computing and some fallacies and pitfalls. So what we're going to do service or uh, well we're going to do software as a service. What do we need from the hardware that's going to do it? Well, we need to be able to communicate. We got to get to the uh, to the software as a service. We're going to need scalability. There's going to be fluctuations. And the demand during the day, it's going to vary during the day. And then as new services are going to come on, they can get dramatically popular. And it's got to work. It's got to be there. It's 24 by 7. If you're doing software as a service, if you install the software on your laptop, you get the laptop, you turn it on, it works. If you're going to replace that with a service, it better be when you try and get the service, it's always there. So you've got to get dependability, scalability, and obviously you have to communicate with it. Uh, so what hardware are we going to use? In the beginning, when the, we first started doing search, which was one of the more first softwares of services, people built it out of mainframe computers because they thought you know, they'd be dependable and they could handle a lot of work and there weren't as many to operate. But that proved to be not the winning combination. The winning combination actually got started here at Berkeley. It was a project called Network of Workstations uh, that led to the use of commodity. We called them workstations, but now you would say... Uh, just commodity computers connected by commodity switches. Uh, these are called clusters today. They're more scalable than a traditional server in that you can put thousands of them together and a server usually is limited to dozens. It's much cheaper than conventional servers. These mainframe servers that they built the first search engines were much more expensive. Uh, a, a book about uh, cluster computing, about warehouse scale computing, thinks it's about a factor of 20. So if you buy kind of a mainframe from HP versus you buy PCs from HP, per gigabyte or per processor, it's 20 times more expensive for the mainframe kind of technology. Uh, another thing that happened, if you carefully select the hardware and carefully de design the software, you can get away with hardly any operators. So a couple of operators for thousands of servers as opposed to a, a, a system administrator for every 20 computers. Another piece of useful technology that helps make this happen is virtual machine monitors. Virtual machine monitors, which you've seen in the operating system class, lets you abstract the hardware and run multiple different versions of operating systems, and that's been useful. And then finally, uh, because the hardware is so much cheaper, you could have a lot more copies of the hardware, and that's how they get redundancy. Rather than gold-plated mainframe hardware, which will still fail if you have a lot of them, well, it's going to fail anyways. We'll buy the cheap stuff, and we'll just have more redundancy to overcome the, the fact that the, the cheap stuff might, might fail more. But that's the, the, the hardware that people use. Now that they, they had to come up with a name for when the whole building is the computer, and the name that's popular is warehouse scale computers. What they found when they started building 100,000 servers, it was a lot cheaper uh, at scale. So when you go to Dell and say, I'd like to buy 100,000 servers, there, you don't have to pay the list price. You get a big deal. When you go to AT&T and say, I want to get 10 gigabits per second of bandwidth, you're going to get a much better deal than if you ask for a megabit at a time. So they, what they found at economies of scale, and then when they were buying, building the power distribution units and they were cooling these things, it, wow, at scale it was cheaper per unit if, it, it, so, and significantly. Some documents of factors of three to seven or eight. Uh, another thing that people notice compared to smaller data centers like we have on this campus is they're underutilized. Uh, commonly, uh, the average would be only 10 or 20 percent utilized for these smaller data centers. Um, so the idea we came, look, we're, it's going to be a lot cheaper. Our costs are less than these small data centers, and they're not all that utilized. We could make money if we made our time available and our equipment and we just charge people for when they use it. So they only have to pay for it when they use it. But if we could get lots of users, we could amortize our big investment, our $200 million investment in our warehouse scale computer. So that led to uh, what's typically called utility computing or public cloud computing that will make this available uh, for sale. So they will sell storage, communication, and computing at pennies per hour. And the other thing that's striking is there's no premium to scale. You say, I would like one computer for 1,000 hours, that's fine. I'd like 1,000 computers for one hour, same price, right? So you can have gigantic, some of the world's biggest systems you can do, and you can rent it at pennies per hour. And how, they, how do they make money? Because at scale, it's so much cheaper that if you were to do it yourself, you'd probably pay more money. It gives you the illusion of infinite scalability. So 
boy, I don't know if I want 100 servers or 1,000 servers or 10,000. You know, don't worry your pretty little head. The utility provider will handle that problem for you. You don't have to, you're your startup company, have to decide that. Uh, and the leading examples are Amazon Web Services. You'll be using that in this class, and others are Google App Engine and Microsoft Azure. So what do I mean by inexpensive? Uh, this, is as today, this is the prices as of today, and you notice that Amazon uh, offers whatever it is, a dozen different size things. The one at the top is the one they got famous for, is now eight and a half cents per hour. Uh, be able to, you get about 1.7 gigabytes of memory and 160 gigabytes of disk. It's a 32-bit address space. But you can see it goes all the way from 8.5 cents an hour to $2.40 an hour. And at $2.40 per hour, you can get one with uh, its uh, 64 gigabytes of memory and 1.7 uh, terabytes of disk space and lots of cores and things like that. So there's a whole menu you can pick from from what you want to use, but you only have to pay by per hour. You don't have to keep using it. So what does this mean? So what, what's the implications of this? A couple thought-provoking things. Uh, there's something called the Top 500 uh, Supercomputer Competition, where they see who's got the fastest computers in the world for running a benchmark. Uh, Amazon put together 290 of the, the bottom row one, the biggest ones that were there, and they were able to calculate that at 240 teraflops. So what is, where did that place them? That made them 42nd in the world, the 42nd fastest computer in the world at $700 per hour, right? Which is pretty remarkable. And so what part of this service is, if with just a credit card, you don't have to sign a contract, you can go in and rent the fastest computer in the world, or the 42nd fastest computer in the world at $700 an hour. That's kind of interesting, but what about, uh, what about uh, startup company? So startup company, Farmville, the company Zigna, on, uh, decided to deploy an Amazon Web Services. Now the prior to Farmville, the biggest online, the most successful game was 5 million users. So I as a startup, suppose they had to build a data center. Well, what, how big a data center would they build? Uh, well, you know, a data center big enough for the biggest one in the world? Well, that's pretty optimistic. Maybe we don't want to do that. Maybe we should do a small one. But, you know, if we guess wrong, uh, if we build too big a data center, we'll invest too much money in the data center. And if, we, if it's not big enough, then customers won't be able to use it. We won't get money. So it's a hard decision to make. So they went with Amazon Web Services. Four days, they had a million users, right? In two months, they had 10 million, and nine months, they had 75 million. So if they'd been calling Dell on the phone and putting stuff in, it would take them six months or more to get that. They would have frustrated a lot of people. But Amazon Web Services, they just stuck their credit card there, and hopefully they got income as the users went up, and they were able to just uh, scale with the demand. So what's, kind of the, what's the impact of all this? All right. How many, uh, you've all heard about the Jeopardy champion I, Watson, uh, which beat all human beings at uh, Jeopardy. And partly because it could push buttons faster than humans, but anyways. <laughs> it was also smart. What hardware drove it? They had 90 IBM Power 750 servers, eight cores per server. It's not the same as the, uh, as the ones at Amazon, but let's, let's pretend it is. So that would be like $200 an hour. So Watson for $200 an hour. So pretty, if you were going to play Jeopardy, at, uh, for $200 an hour, you could have the world champion at your service. So that's about as much as lawyers and accountants make. If you were to hire, a, to ask them to do something, you know, they, have, they start this little clock when you call them on the phone. It's about $200 an hour. So looking down the road, what task could AI be as good as a highly trained person at $200 an hour? Because you could rent it for that. And so, hmm. And then what's that going to mean for society, right? If right now, you, for $200, you could have as much computing power as IBM used and that's what people get paid, you know, what's the implications of all this? Well, this is something you might want to think about and talk to uh, your friends who are studying to be lawyers or accountants <laughs> <laughs> to, make, to, to warm the cockles of their heart. By the way, in just a couple of years, something's going to happen. Uh, a fallacy is something that sounds kind of true, but it's, it's false, right? It's, it's, a, it's not thinking of things incorrectly. Pitfall is a thing, even when you know it's going to happen, it's going to get you, right? You know there's a danger, it's a pitfall, it happens to us all the time. So if a software fail, uh, project is falling behind schedule, you catch up, you add more people, right? 
uh, it actually makes it worse, you know, which is certainly ironic. Why could that be true? Well, because it takes, when you add people, first they have to come up to speed. So, and then, because there's more people, you have more people to communicate, so you spend more of your time communicating. So this was uh, Fred Brooks, which we mentioned ma last time in this classic book, A Mythical Man Was. Adding manpower to a late software project makes it later, right? So ironically, this is behind, you're gonna put a lot more people on it, it makes it worse. Uh, what, you, what, so what you should do is reduce the project, right? If it's behind, you should reduce what you do, and that fits in really well with the Agile approach, right? This is kind of the more waterfall model where you're going these big phases and you're trying to do that. Uh, with Agile, you're checking every two weeks, and uh, you naturally are supposed to, if your user stories are too long, cut back. The pitfall is ignoring the cost of software design. Since it's approximately, I, th I think the danger is, well, it doesn't cost anything to manufacture software, so it doesn't cost anything to remanufacture it, right? The, what you're ignoring is the cost of software design and test. That does have costs associated with it. So when dealing with customers, they think, well, change is, is free. It's not true. There's a lot of work to do that. And I can't help but wonder if this same kind of fallacy here or uh, same pitfall is since it doesn't cost anything to manufacture, is that the same rationale to private data? I'm not stealing anything. It's free, right? It costs nothing to steal it. So, uh, why should I pay for development it, since manufacturing is free? Okay, last slide from this chapter is what we call the virtuous triangle here. So uh, we think of this uh, th to build long-lasting software. There are these three jewels here that this course is dependent on. That's why this really interesting time to teach this material and learn this material. First of all, software has been revolutionized to be as a service. Armand and I think this will be every year more and more software will be as that service. And cloud computing is this really interesting infrastructure in the PC era that's going to be able to do it. Uh, that's one. Then there's the agile development model, which was invented independent of all this, right? This is out of frustration with waterfall that came the agile development model, and it's got this uh, teams and rapid iteration, two pizza teams and rapid innovation. Uh, it is true that the agile development model led to... Uh, the Ruby language was invented independent of all this, uh, but the Rails framework was tied with the Agile development. So we think of this virtuous triangle of supporting each other, uh, that the link between uh, SaaS computing and uh, Agile is that because you can deploy the application in the cloud, which we'll do in this class, the customer quickly gets to see it, right? So every two weeks, they can see it working uh, very easily. We think the tie-in between uh, SaaS computing and highly productive frameworks is that the frameworks have these design patterns. You're going to learn more about design patterns that match the SAS needs. And this final link at the bottom here is between highly productive frameworks like Rails and Agile development is they're designed for each other. So what's really different compared to when I learned a kind of a software engineering class is instead of just lecturing or preaching to you, you should be doing this, there's tools that make it easy to do. So it'll feel natural to do the things that we tell you to do because that's what the tools do rather than, oh, don't start writing code yet. You know, we're gonna, you're going to do test-driven development because you're going to see Cucumber in our spec. It'll seem natural that way. So it's a really exciting and powerful set of ideas here.